Hi everybody, my name is Nancy Solomon. I'm the director of Long Island Traditions. Today is March 22nd, 2021, and I'm here talking with Frank Scobo, the owner and operator of a local construction company. We are here on one of our tugboats, uh, the Bay Star. Okay, and we're here in Port Washington, New York. So the first thing I'd like you to share with us is how you got into this. Where did you grow up and what were some of the things that led you here? Well, I grew up in Port Washington, uh, born and raised, and graduated from Trevor High School. Uh, I've always enjoyed being on the water. Um, my brother-in-law, Steve, actually got me into boating. And uh, there was one day I jumped on the boat and I had a great time. And that kind of started the whole thing off. I went into the commercial end of it, started in 2003. And uh, how old were you at the time? Oh, let's see. Uh, divide by one, carry the two. I was 20, 27, somewhere around there. Okay, so, so, so what did you do before so, that? Um, <laughs> Uh, general construction and you know at first it started out as a leisure uh, activity where I you know go on the boats and have a great time and explore and I wanted to get my commercial mariner's license so I started in 2004 uh, 2005 and um, got my first license the six pack is what they call it operator of uninspected towing vessel and then from there I just continued the education I went to SUNY Maritime I went to uh, the Siemens Institute at Snug Harbor uh, the nautical school here on Long Island and in, uh, up in Massachusetts and, and down in Florida and North Carolina and, and, and Texas and it just expanded you know on and on and on so my first job for a tugboat was for ice breaking and I bid the job without having a tugboat and when I won the bid that's what <laughs> kind of prompted me to go buy a tugboat. So you what know? was the first time you ever worked on a tugboat? <laughs> uh, first time I was on a tug 2006 uh, I was on a Buchanan boat with one of our captains 2007 and I loved it. Um, having been exposed to the recreational towing vessel, uh, the assist vessel, like sea tow, towboat, things of that nature, I was exposed a little bit to that. And that was very fascinating because sometimes people called you when the weather wasn't great or they called you when they had a dead battery. And I would ride with my brother-in-law and experience that. It was a lot of fun. It really was a lot of fun. And from there, it just expanded got my first tugboat uh, and barge and uh, let's see that was 2000 first barge was 2011 2011 so and then we just grew over the years so tell me about that bid that you made and what did you do <laughs> uh, I put a bid in for ice breaking and when we received the notice back it said hey congratulations you are the successful and only bidder of contract number blah 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 and I just scratched my head and my father said hey congratulations now I gotta go buy a tugboat so we happened to find at that time it was the Commodore Perry the tug Commodore Perry uh, up in Lake Huron New York close to the Ontario border myself uh, my brother-in-law drove up looked at the boat the boat was nice. We bought it for $25,000, shipped it on truck down to Havistraw, New York, repaired it, got it ready, put it in the water. And uh, now the first day that we put it in the water after we worked on it for about a week and a half, I'm outside and I'm videotaping because it's a proud moment. I wanted to videotape for my father and you know he he owns uh, the company with my mother and I'm videotaping and I see the tug being lowered into the water with the slings and then all of a sudden I hear a lot of yelling and a lot of screaming and then the tug comes back up out of the water one of the prior owners used a wood plug in the sea chest the boat was on land for years it dried out so when they put the boat in the water the little plug popped out and the boat started to take on water. So 
it was uh, it was rather interesting and comical. I still have that video today. Um, but we just uh, we earned our bones along the way over the last 11, 12 years or so uh, to where we are right now. Um, do you have earlier memories of going out on the water growing up, you know, and ever going um, on a tugboat? <laughs> you know, I was with my, uh, with, again, with my brother-in-law Steve, and uh, even though I'm a good swimmer, I was petrified of the water, and there's actually a photo of it somewhere. Someone's probably holding it for ransom. There's a picture of me bear hugging an outboard because I was petrified because something had rubbed up against my leg. So here I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I'm going to get eaten by a shark. So I'm bear hugging the outboard and my brother-in-law took the picture. And um, that was one of the more memorable, funny moments. And then over time, I just got acclimated to it. And, uh, you know, my very first boat that I owned was with my cousin. We owned a little 26-foot bay liner. We didn't know anything about boats, but we wanted to use it as a floating armchair. So we had it at a local marina, and what we would do is go down to the marina with our cooler, get on our 1978 26-foot bay liner, untie the lines, push it over to the other side of the dock, tie up, and that was our voyage for the day. Sit there, eat, barbecue, whatever, untie at the end of the day, push back, tie up, and that was it because we didn't know how to boat we didn't know what you know about driving boats and mechanical stuff but we enjoyed being on the water so you know we uh, we had a really good time with that boat and then we sold it so what was your first memory of actually being on a tugboat uh 2006 uh you got a marine was with rod and he called me up and he said frankie why don't you come down and take a look because I was always fascinated. You know, I was like a little kid from the fence looking through and seeing the tugboats and making unbelievable maneuvers and moving stuff around. And I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. He brought me on and I was just in awe. I was in awe. I was in awe with the horsepower, the ability, the crew, the ability and experience of the captain and the crew. It was just amazing. And I was right here in Hempstead Harbor, shifted a few things around a few barges made a few moves like it was like it was nothing like he was just parallel parking a car it was very impressive and I'm like I got to learn how to do this I got to learn how to do this and where was this right over in Hempstead Harbor on one of the sand docks which has a tremendous history here in Paul Washington as you know uh, the sand mines down on West Shore Road built New York City um, from the 19 I want to say early 20s on um it was genovese pope uh gotham stand and sewn new york trap rock and whatnot so uh the tugboats were responsible for pushing around the barges that came in to get loaded with the sand and the stone and take them to wherever the distribution points are so it was it was a short period on the boat but it was extremely meaningful and it really opened up my eyes like wow this is different world that you really you drive by and you look but you don't really know what goes into it absolutely amazing and there aren't too many shows I mean, you see a few shows now about the actual workings of uh the boat and the harbor and the crew but um yeah it's just very fascinating very fascinating so you you got your your tugboat in working order in order to break ice so tell me a little bit about that project and what you learned through it uh, <laughs> I learned that it's very important to have double sea chest because in the winter time on a uh, raw water cooled boat where the sea water comes into the boat and cools the motor and goes back out when you're breaking ice the ice tends to accumulate inside the sea chest and you if that gets blocked off your motor rules will overheat and like I said I you know we didn't have much experience and I couldn't figure out why the boat that I bought which, like I said, the Commodore Perry uh, was built by the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Uh, I'm sorry, it's built by uh, Burger Boats in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, for the U.S. Lighthouse Service. And that boat, tremendous history, uh, built in 1939 or commissioned to be built in 1939 for the U.S. Lighthouse Service to break ice on the Ohio River. But the U.S. Lighthouse Service 
at the end of 1939 became the U.S. Coast Guard. But when the boat came out, it had all USLH stamps all over it. So that boat had multiple sea chests that you could just flip one to the other, keep the boat running. And, you know, here I am with my brother-in-law. We're breaking ice and I'm down in the engine room, changing out the, uh, the sea chest, dumping out the ice in the bilge and, you know, sealing it back up and switching over. And uh, we, at that time, we didn't know the capability of the boat. And after working it for 12 hours, we knew right away, we knew right away an absolute battleship built by an American company pre-World War II, uh, almost indestructible. That boat is still in service today at the Intrepid Air Sea Space Museum. They purchased it as their tender. We sold it to them in 2016. So we had it from 2009 to 2016. Now. I know, I've heard the, the phrase tender before. Can you describe what a tender is? A tender is a supplemental vessel uh, to, a, a, to augment the operation of the main vessel. In that particular instance, the Intrepid, one of the most famous museums, uh, not only here in the, in the U.S., but I think throughout the world. It's got a tremendous history, um, American and abroad. So. The tender, the Phyllis K, the tug is still there, still labeled the Phyllis K. That will enable the crew to maneuver around the Intrepid, paint, repair, um, fix anything that needs to from the water line up, obviously, because it's, you know, floating. And if, uh, if they had to adjust the line, if they had to move anything around, they could use the, the tug, the Phyllis K, to push it around a little bit or, or whatever they had to do. Uh, because that boat, the Phyllis K, at the time when we bought it, was the Commodore Perry, um, the crew that built that boat in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, had relatives who worked on the Intrepid. So it was a whole big tied together loop. So it was great. So how long were you breaking ice? <laughs> uh, with that boat, it was approximately I want to say a total of 10 days in the winter of 2009-2010. Um, 10 long days. And there's actually a photo, I believe, on Facebook of myself and my brother-in-law um, out here in Manhasset Bay. We actually were breaking ice to not only get out of the bay, but we were breaking ice to get back in. The ice was so thick that, don't try this at home kids, the ice was so thick that we were able to get the boat up onto the ice and get off the boat and walk around it. That's how thick the ice was. And um, unbelievable, unbelievable. Of course, we had all the safety gear on and life jackets and you know cold weather gear and whatnot. But yeah, it was almost 14 inches thick where the boat had a hard time getting through it, but it did. That boat was designed to break ice in fresh water. So obviously in salt water, it'll do a, a, a much better job, but yeah. There's a video, don't show my mother, <laughs> I'm in a picture of me walking alongside the tug here in Manhasset Bay. Now why is it easier to do it in salt water? Uh, salt water doesn't have the uh, freezing temperatures that fresh water, uh, that fresh water has. Fresh water will freeze much quicker, much quicker. Salt water, um, it's, uh, it adds more buoyancy, it's a little thicker, but it won't freeze as fast as fresh or brackish. Brackish water is half of a mix, salt and fresh. Yeah, um, breaking freshwater ice, very difficult, very difficult. What are some of the freshwater projects you've worked on? Uh, up the Hudson River, all the way up by uh, just before, I guess the Troy Lock would be the first one. Uh, you have all the freshwater tributaries that run down into the Hudson. And working up there, 2013, uh, briefly, it was in the winter and it was very difficult because over here, you know, down on Long Island, for the temperature, for the water to freeze, it would have to be somewhere around 33, 34, somewhere in that area. Fresh water, you have cold temperatures and no wind, instantly, it'll freeze right up, instantly. in uh, August of 2016. Did you acquire other 
Oh, boats yes. in the, uh, during oh, that time? <laughs> yes. Uh, we bought the Tug Island. Um, that boat we purchased from Coastline. We also purchased this boat from Coastline. Uh, that was a single screw, 75 foot, 600 horsepower, uh, three quarter inch thick steel tug. Very powerful boat. Uh, we had that. Uh, we sold the Ireland to a local construction company. And let's see, we bought that in, we sold that in 2015. And after searching around, we found the base store. It didn't make financial sense to own three tugboats. We weren't running three tugboats. We had supplemental boats, uh, the Patriot, the Legacy, smaller uh, aluminum work style boats that could push and tow and things of that nature. But I didn't need something 75, you know, 60 and 45. Uh, so we sold off everything and we just run the base star right now for all of our work, all of our main work. So. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to have this boat and you know what are we some were, of the, the things that people wouldn't know about this boat <laughs> so this boat was built in 1958 by blount uh, she was built for the bethlehem steel company and uh, three quarter inch thick sides she's designed to move she was designed to move their steel barges uh, their material barges around at their dock and from there, she was uh, purchased by, um, let's see, she was owned by Thornton Marine. So she was the Coney Island, uh, single screw boat. She was also uh, owned by a Brooklyn-based towing company, working New York Harbor, towing barges, uh, breaking ice, um, predominantly construction barges, uh, material barges. The Coast Guard regulation changed from a single screw motor to a twin screw motor. All the oil, oil barges have to be pushed, pulled, towed by a vessel with two motors, minimum, minimum. So uh, most tugs are uh, working in the harbor now are twin screw uh, for anything involving petroleum based products. So um, we bought this in 2016 and started to fix it up and kind of set it up the way we want. We wanted something with two motors. Uh, one of my captains, so true, said if you can run a single screw boat, you can run anything. And it really is, uh, it really is true to heart. I learned on a single screw boat. So having twin screws and the ability to maneuver and shift and you know spin around in most conditions it was an absolute dream because if you're driving a single screw tugboat, one propeller, one motor, for the most part, one one rudder, uh, one one propeller, one motor. Um, if you get out of shape, if you get set down, uh, if you if you get sideways, it is very difficult to make back up and to get back into shape. Uh, to depending upon what your maneuvers are. So um, having learned on that, you're always one or two steps ahead thinking, where's the wind gonna put you? Where's the tide gonna put you? Because you can't make adjustments that easily with the single screw boat. So you have to pre-plan, pre -plan, you have to prepare, and you have to come in, execute your plan, have a backup plan, <laughs> and you know set up to do what you gotta do, get made up and go. So, but having, you know, a twin screw boat, it was just, you know, I look and say, why didn't I do this earlier? You know, why didn't I buy this earlier? When did they start making twin screw boats? Oh, uh, Roughly. most of the twin screw tugs, I believe, came about, I want to say, 50s-ish, 60s. Uh -huh. Okay, so... So yeah, uh, having a twin screw boat just really improved the operation and modernized uh, the way that we're able to do things a little bit. Um, we still own single screw uh, vessels, but having twin screw, it, uh, it just, it, it's a world of difference. We actually had an issue uh, with one of our single screw boats. We were in New York Harbor and uh, somehow fuel was mixed with water and we were, we were pushing a barge, a scrap barge, out of Brooklyn, down into the port of Newark, and the Coast Guard called us, vessel traffic, 
and they said, uh, Ireland, um, are you guys, are you guys on fire? And we're like, we're checking the entry room, like, negative, we're, oh, you're blowing a lot of white smoke. There was fuel mixed, there was water mixed in with the fuel. We didn't know it. And, oh my God, you got to get down to the engine room, clear the issue, uh, mitigate the problem, regain fuel pressure, all while, you know, navigating through traffic. I mean, thank God we had the best crew, but you had to navigate through traffic, uh, you know, stay clear of, um, get some kind of uh, set and drift course, God forbid you lost propulsion, come up with the backup plan. So all those things happen in the blink of an eye. So uh, having, having two motors is just unbelievable. Um, so what were some of the things that enabled you to become a captain and to hire a crew? What are some of the things that people don't know about how, so, you, how you do all of this? Uh, it is a great deal of time and commitment to obtain a license to operate a towing vessel. Uh, a vessel over 26 feet, that's a Coast Guard regulation. So it is um, thousands of hours, many courses in navigation, training, stability, um, towing, uh, seamanship, uh, all kinds of navigational, educational training required, plus you have to pass exams. And then you have to go and actually have the sea service. So you have to work on boats. And for years, um, you know, Yes, the family construction company owned the boats, but I wasn't, you know, the single guy at the helm. We had captains with master of tow licenses, and I would learn literally from some of the best in the industry. Like I said, if you can learn on a single screw tow boat, tugboat, you can drive anything. And uh, that's the way that we started out. And it's, when I tell you, many nights uh, and days, because, you know, we're usually 12 hour days, 12 hours on. Uh, you know, two two watches. Um, if you'd be on twelve, it's six and six. But um, you know, you could leave, and you don't pick your schedule. You have to go by the tide, the location of where you're going, and what you're trying to accomplish. So I don't pick when I get. Oh, I'm gonna feel like I'm gonna go in at nine o'clock today. It doesn't work like that. If the tide at the gate at Hellgate is at you know midnight, or if it's at one a.m. You're on the boat by eight. You're, you know, getting ready. You do all your safety checks, your your equipment checks, and then you're, you know, getting ready to go so that you can make the tide at the gate. You don't ever want to miss the tide at the gate within reason. Uh, there was one event. We were towing a, a barge on a hauser. Um, we had a relatively long hauser out. We had plenty of catenary, and we missed we missed the tide at Hellgate. But at that point, we were getting flooded. Uh, we were with the flood tide. So as we get through Hellgate, our speed increased from, I want to say about six and a half knots to almost 11 knots. It was crazy. So I'm up in the wheelhouse with one of the captains and uh, I look over and I say, oh gee, that person has a barge just like us. And then I realized our barge was almost going to trip us. Because if you don't take the gate right, <laughs> if you don't take the gate right, what you're towing will go faster than you. <laughs> so we had to quickly make maneuvers, pull it back in on our side, shorten up the house. It was, it, it was okay. It was one of the things that the heavy rain a couple days before, extreme tides, moon tides, and we just missed um, slack at the gate. So it was, uh, <laughs> it's comical now. Back then, you know, it was uh, frightening. And people say, what's it like being on a tugboat? So, well, it's roughly 11 hours and 50 minutes of boredom, followed by about eight minutes of sheer terror and uh, two minutes of uh, euphoria because uh, you made it, you know, kind of a thing. 
So. Have you had to negotiate like canal locks in your um, career? No, we haven't done any, uh, and we haven't transversed any locks. Okay. And uh, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with that. Because so, that's the whole process. So besides Hellgate, and can you describe where Hellgate is? What are some of the other places that are are tricky? So, uh, Huntington is tricky, but we'll get into that in a minute. So Hellgate, uh, on the East River, right between the Hellgate, Hellgate Railroad Bridge, right between uh, you have, it's Queens, Astoria, the power plant, and then you have Randall's Island. Um, and it, the body of water over there, the depth, uh, goes from anywhere from I believe 50 40 to 40 to 50 it drops off to 70 to 80 and the currents that run in and out of there because you have such a sheer drop instantly the currents are tremendous and then within the currents you have a lot of eddies uh, eddies are um, subcurrents that will form due to rushing water going in one direction or the other. So if everything is flowing this way, you might actually cre create enough hydrostatic energy that it's spinning over here. Um, and if you get caught into that, you'll actually feel it. Uh, they call the Hellgate the washing machine. Uh, sometimes when you go through it, you're kind of getting mixed around and you'll feel it. You'll know where you are with the tide. Um, one time we were coming through Hellgate and uh, we we're, were on a house we were coming from Brooklyn, coming back to Long Island, and we we're actually gonna head out to Huntington. And like I said, we, another time that we kind of missed the tide. And so I noticed my speed as I'm getting closer to the gate, I'm like, ah, I think I missed it. And I got this barge on a hauser and I go from three knots down to 2.6, down to 2.2, down to two, and I see a woman in a baby carriage. She's, you know, on the East River, walking along the East River. And I say, wow, um, okay, I'm going to kind of figure out where I am with the marker. And then before I know it, the woman in the baby carriage is passing me and I'm going backwards. So the current was so, uh, so rough that day and it was uh, extreme that we had to round up and try it again when you catch a current. Like I said, you can't pick the time that you're going to go. You have to go by the tides. Uh, and, and, and really the currents. So you really got to pick your, you got to pick your, uh, and you got to plan ahead, obviously, to, to get there. Aside from there, um, sorry, aside from there, you have, um, you have uh, Huntington, Huntington Harbor, um, right where Huntington Bay meets Huntington Harbor. It's like a bottleneck. And uh, if you catch that in the hop of the tide, you are facing, you're dealing with four knots of current, five knots of current, easy. So, and if you don't transverse that while you're towing, because we've had to tow some barges and vessels into there, you don't transverse that correctly, man, your tow will run you over, you'll get spun around. Uh, there's a few different areas uh, similar to that where bottlenecks, you have a large volume of water squeezing into an area. So, if you're entering the harbor and you're in the hop of the tide, hop is usually the middle, that's when it runs the fastest and the strongest. Um, so if you're in the hop and you're entering there, you could actually get slingshotted through almost. That's the effect that it'll give you. So, um, Mamaroneck Harbor, uh, around here, somewhat of the same. Um, Stanford, not too much. There's a few areas. Um, it's anywhere where a large body of water squeezes down to a skinny body of water or you have a tremendous change in the soundings where you're from 30 feet to 50. Instant drop like that, you'll get a lot of current and a lot of pull. So, so tell me about some of your jobs, your customers, some of the things that you, you work on. You know. Some of our, the jobs that we've uh, completed uh, residential marine construction, bulkhead docks, floats, commercial contractors, bulkheads in the five boroughs, um, marine structures. We've done a lot of dredging work, um, you know, permanent dredging work, and we've done some ice breaking. We've done some ship assist. We had to assist an oil barge a couple times. Um, ice breaking, like I said, we had to break ice, flushing bay. 
uh, here in Manhasset Bay, Hempstead Harbor, uh, obviously Newtown Creek, uh, the Gowanus, Westchester Creek, so um, to clear the area for oil barges. Mariner Carver, we had to break ice for Director Shipyard because they had very special aluminum vessels coming in there. So we had to open up, uh, we had to open up Mariner Carver for Directors. And that was in 2009 and 10. Um, so a lot of it is also moving our own equipment from job to job. We rebuilt the Lighthouse Foundation in Huntington from 2016 to 2018. And we were basically staged and living out there for a little bit over two years. And uh, then from there, we went to Brooklyn for about two years, um, year and a half, two years. And we came back and we've been between uh, Oyster Bay, Smithtown, Mamaroneck, uh, again in Queens, Brooklyn, you know, there's, there's a lot of water around here. So yeah. a lot of waterfront structures. Um, it pretty much covers most the residential, commercial, and industrial. Uh, we've had to supply, we've had to supply vessels with either fuel um, or other things that like we have a you know big aft deck, so we're able to put construction materials on here, go to a site, offload if we had to, uh, bring them fuel and things of that nature to assist their operation. So, at any time we would do a dredge job, um, you have to have a tug stand by with the barge, so the tug would always, and unfortunately for the most part, dredging is always in cold weather, so <laughs> at least up here in the northeast it is, so. Um, what's your favorite part of the job? Uh, favorite part of the job, at the end of the day when everything went fairly well and the equipment worked and we're able to accomplish the goal and the mission that we set out to do and to me that's my favorite part um, there's a little anxiety built up to it because so much can go wrong and uh, so many things can happen and obviously crew safety always number one crew safety vessel safety number number one and you know we, we take the extra step and even doing so you know, there have been case studies in New York Harbor where deckhands have gotten hurt or killed. And, you know, people don't realize in a blink of an eye, it, 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 could, it could change everybody's life. Um, so we're, we're very cautious about that. Very, very cautious. And aside from all the mandated safety, we also kind of take it a step further. If we're transversing an area that's treacherous to some extent, whether we're light tug or we're engaged in towing, um, at that instant and actually sometime before, uh, we have someone in the engine room monitoring the heart of the operation. You know, everything that's below deck, uh, the motors, the gears, the clutch, everything. Um, not every operation is perfect, but if something had to go wrong, you don't want it to happen at a very precarious, you know, spot or a dangerous spot. So if you're, if it's flat calm like this and you lose a motor or your fuel pressure drops um, or, you know, you, uh, you're steering one out, that happened to us, steering one out. If you're, you know, a beautiful day like this, you're not posing a threat to anybody instantly, there's a little bit of a relief that you can address it accordingly. The system is built up to have abundance of redundance, backups to backups for steering, for motors, for fuel, whatever it might be. Um, but still, you put in the element of trying to squeeze in a canal, towing a barge, and now you lose fuel pressure or you lose steering and you, <laughs> you lose uh, the ability to maneuver. Now it changes the dynamic drastically drastically so like I said getting back to the dock completed mission everything is good we did what we had to do no mechanical breakdowns no injuries that's a great day that's a great day now how many crew people do you have a minimum of two maximum of five depends upon where we're going and what we're doing and that's on the boat if we uh, pick up one of our barges there may be two or three crew members 
on that barge, plus the minimum of two or three on here. So, yeah. And what's the furthest you've ever had to go, you know? Ooh, uh, let's see, from the sound side all the way out to Block Island. Um, Block Island, you have to pick your day, you gotta pick your day. All the way out to Block Island, uh, Block Island Sound, and then going out behind, underneath the Verrazano. Um, I wanna say Delaware Water Gap, maybe? Someone that will, yeah. yeah. Fire Island, that's very interesting. And a tug that draws nine feet <laughs> when you get to the South Shore. So uh, the chart is a, it's a best guess of where the sandbar should be. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're always cautious when we have to go to the South Shore. Always, always cautious. What were you doing at Fire Island? We had to bring a barge over there, and uh, we had to bring it from here. Too big to transport on the road, so we had to tow it all the way around and get it up into Fire Island for a job over there for a contractor. And uh, we had to drop off a barge and pick up a barge. And round trip, it's 20, 26 hours, 28 hours. So, yeah, uh, four man crew, four, four, five, five man crew. So, um, and you have to catch the times at the gate correctly. You want to catch the tide uh, around the buttermilk down, which is down by um, lower lower Brooklyn, between Staten Island and Brooklyn, a uh, section of water where all the barges come into. So you got to catch the tide there around the Verrazano, and then you got to catch the tide coming up into Fire Island Inlet. So, um, you know, all those things have to be planned accordingly. So. And then you throw in the occasional, all right, so we lost a few knots, or we lost a knot here or there. How do you, you know, how do you make up for that? There was a time where we were coming back here to Manhasset Bay. We missed the tide and we almost got stuck, but we had to stay on the boat until we had enough water to come back in. You know, thank God we had provisions and, you know, it's, uh, we had some creature comforts, you know, TV and whatever, but you had to hang out until you have the water to come in, so especially here in the bay. Um, they haven't dredged it in years. Oil barges used to run in here all the time. Sand barges uh, from the sand pits were right over here. So when those larger vessels were in and out constantly, you didn't have a problem with draft. You didn't have a problem with your soundings. Because that stopped, the bay has silted over over the years. And uh, you know, washout and, and tidal influence, it's definitely the bottom's changed. Definitely changed. Are there going to be problems for you if they don't? Um, you know? No, again, I you know I have a short window when I leave. I have to go out on close to high tide as possible, mm, as I close to it. high tide as possible. So, yeah, and I just got again. You got to just plan for that. So tomorrow we have to tomorrow Thursday we have to do something. High tide is either going to be eight in the morning or eight o'clock at night, and I got to watch the winds and see where we're going to go and. That'll dictate whether I'm going in the morning or going at night. So, yeah, you don't you don't set your schedule. The tides and the weather sets your schedule. So, um, what happened during Superstorm Sandy and Irene? Wow, uh, we got lucky right here. A lot of people didn't get lucky, and I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna correct that. For the most part this area, this peninsula, uh, got very lucky because if the winds didn't change, if everything had continued with the tide and the winds, there would have been an extra two to three feet of water here in this area. We were actually docked right over here. And we were docked right over there where the other crane barge is. And we dropped um, our lines on the pilings and we dropped some weights on the lines. And the reason why we did that is just in case um, the tide came up and over, something would be holding our boat. And we had a barge over here, and the, at the time we had the Ireland. The Ireland was over there. Phyllis K was tucked in. Uh, Phyllis K was tucked in over here. And um, we were 15 minutes away from losing everything. 
spuds popping up off the barges because the tide comes up, you don't have enough length on your spuds to hold you. You know what I'm saying? Because once you come up and your spuds dead end out and you have no more ground below you, uh, you're free floating and with the wind. So we were right over there and we were watching it. We were watching it and thank God we took the precautions that we did to secure everything. Um, a lot of areas, as, as we know, were devastated and some people are still repairing. There are some projects now that the government is just starting to repair. So, yeah, we got, uh, we got very lucky, but we had to plan. And that's, you know, everyone, everyone who has a boat, you have to plan um, for when you have a, a, a storm like that. Um, and us on the commercial end, we have a huge responsibility to make sure that you uh, mitigate potential problems before they could happen. You know, and for plan because, all right, if the wind blows a sailboat off the mooring or if it blows it out of a marina, it's going to do some damage, no doubt. If 65 feet at 110 tons gets loose, it's it's a wrecking ball. So, um, yeah, we try to uh, we, we try to plan and, and prepare for that. Knock on wood, hopefully we won't get any storms, but Irene and Sandy, because we had them back to back, uh, Irene and Sandy, it was it was very very um, nerve-wracking, if you will, because we're watching it. Now, what were some of the projects that you had to do post Sandy to address the damage that oh, was done? We had we had a tremendous cleanup. We had uh, shoreline restoration that really didn't get started until between permits, um, between permits and. Uh, staging probably not till 2015 bulkheads docks houses um floats piers and some of it just got destroyed i mean manhasset bay hempstead harbor uh oyster bay um city island city island unbelievable a lot of damage over there we did a lot of restoration a lot of restoration work in, in city island so it just uh um, you're waiting for permits, you're waiting for the funding, you know, the customers got to get everything lined up, and they weren't the only ones. So, you know, we had customers on the South Shore as well, uh, Belmore in that area, Belmore, Seaford. Everyone was going through the same thing. So by the time everyone got their plans and permits and whatnot, we really started doing major repairs mid to end of 2014, right through until 20, 2018 almost four years worth of restoration work. And like I said, there are some jobs now that the government is still getting around to repairing. How has the COVID pandemic affected your business? Uh, tremendous. So, listen, the most important thing is everyone's health and safety. That's the most important. So, um, you know, everything else we can kind of work through, but from our end, the insurance industry and all of the work that we had scheduled, you know, everyone was kind of fighting not only for survival, uh, but the insurance industry, you know, when we said, hey, we have to lay up our equipment because although we didn't get shut down, we got listed as essential and we still had to do some work, everything came to a grinding halt because the government agency that issued the permits were working from home or not working at all. So jobs got delayed, permits got delayed, um, and then if there was any additional damage after the permits were issued, then you had, to, you had to try to address that, where, hey, the plan said we're gonna do A, B, and C, but now it took eight months to get, or you know, four months to get permits, so here we are, we're getting started. The conditions change, we need to make a modification. So, um, it was difficult to uh, keep everybody busy. It was difficult to find a solution to the problem. And I think we did okay. I think we did okay. But like I said, the most important thing is everyone's health and safety and um, taking all the precautions. That was interesting because, you know, you're working on the boat and you're in a mask, uh, rubber gloves, hearing protection and 
uh, obviously because of, you know, with depending on whether you work in the engine room or near a rig. with the required safety uh, mandates on a, on a towing vessel, yeah, whether in a mask or gloves or whatever it might be, it added another another facet of not only are you, um, you know, it's difficult to communicate because you have machinery around you, you have uh, other factors, and now you're yelling through your mask, hey, we got to put the pile over there, we want. <laughs> Okay, you gotta put the pile over there. I can't hear you. You gotta put the pile over there. You know, kind of a thing. So, um, yeah, that was uh, that was interesting. We slowed down like everybody else. We uh, we slowed down and had to um, reshift and reorganize to get through it. So it was difficult, but I I believe we did a good job. Again, everyone everyone's health and safety. That was the most important thing. So. Yeah. So. There are so many people here in Port Washington that don't know anything about what tugboats or tenders do and a lot of things that you've shared with us today. If there's one thing that you would want them to know, what would it be? Uh, I'm going to speak, I guess, uh, on, the, on behalf of the commercial industry. We, us, in the commercial industry, like you see here, um, we're not we're not bad guys. When you go to certain marinas with this, and a couple times we've had to stay at a few places. We were recently in Oyster Bay, and it had a warm welcome in Oyster Bay. But you go into some areas, and they're like a, tug, a tugboat. What is that thing doing here? You know, um, people want industry. They want commerce. They want to have their docks built and and they want things repaired and they want their boats in and think well you need that you need this infrastructure to have that so you know there was and i'm very surprised we received a lot of compliments on facebook of the boat and one gentleman said you know where have you been all these years i said well <laughs> we've been working on other jobs he's like oh i really love seeing the boat there it brings back to the traditions that were once here in port washington and I said, well, you're a rare breed because some people, they don't want to see a tugboat. You know, they want to see the three million dollar yacht or the or the fancy sailboat. And so, um, yeah, we're not we're not bad people, you know. And I was very happy. I was elated to see so many positive comments. And it wasn't until one of my employees said, hey, boss, you're getting comments on Facebook about the star. I'm like, uh oh, because my first reaction is this is going to be negative. Uh oh. Let me get my attorney on the phone. Let me see what's going to happen now. You know, but he said, no, 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 it's all positive. It's all positive. So, and a few people have said, hey, can we get a tour of that thing? So, um, we're actually going to take some people out at the end of next week for a tour on the boat. So, a lot of history. And there's a lot of history here in Port Washington, like I said, uh, aside from the oil, from the sand, uh, clipper ship right over here, um, the lighthouses. Uh, that are just in this area. There's so much maritime and nautical history. It's really, um, it's really unbelievable. And you have people that move here from the city because they love it, but they don't really know uh, the old clam diggers. You know, um, the uh, Pan American Flight out of here. Um, the sand that built New York City came from Hempstead Harbor, Gotham Sand and Stone, New York Trap Rock, Genovese Pope. Uh, you know. Uh, colonial sand and stone so that built New York City and uh, the last load of sand that came out of the sand miners uh, area in Hempstead Harbor built the World Trade Center that was taken down in 2001 that was the last load of sand that came out of there and then they closed down now I'm gonna follow up with you and ask them what's the one thing you'd want them to know about your job <sighs> the one thing about my job Things that, the two top things that, that people don't know. <laughs> um, well, the two two things are tugboat tugboat captains, um, 
Some people ask, you know, hey, why do you wear sunglasses? That's so you don't see the fear in my eyes when I'm docking. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, the two things are about people working on the water, the dedication and the history and the tradition, really, um, of the maritime culture. And we give 110%. You know, listen, we all have jobs like everybody else. Um, part of it is family history. Part of it is uh, a job and a career that you take on and, and you want to you wanna promote and improve. And a lot, a lot of it's a love, uh, a love for the water and respect. And, you know, back in the day, I would go out in any weather. Now, after doing this for 15 years, I'm like, eh custom to 30 I don't think so we're gonna stay in the harbor you know when I was a young kid oh let's go it doesn't matter now uh, not so much so yeah it's a it's a true love it's a true love of the of the maritime industry it really is what does the future hold for your profession and you know this business I don't know I really don't know um, we we have a lot of opportunities we're trying to take advantage of and explore all of the opportunities that are out there we have work thank god um, we're always trying to gather new work we don't know what's going to happen with the economy um, and right now there's a lot of government jobs that are on hold everyone's kind of waiting we have to see how everything plays out um, do we have contingency plans absolutely uh, abundance of redundance and backup and so I think uh, I think the future um, is positive from what I see a lot of people want to continue the projects that they were looking to do in 2019 and 2020 uh, I think there's new opportunities for new projects in uh, in this year um, and we we're going to set ourselves up in a way that meeting all the regulations and the requirements that well, I, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. I don't know what's going to happen five years from now, but you know we have, a, uh, we have a game plan and nobody saw really COVID coming. Nobody saw the pandemic and how devastating it was going to be. Um, again, forget the financial aspect. We can always earn and make money, hopefully. Um, you know, people's health. So what do you do? If you don't have your health, if your family doesn't have the health, so it's uh, we're just kind of taking it um, one month at a time. We have a plan, long range, short term, but we'll see what happens over the next couple of years. Where's the next generation of tugboat captains coming from? <laughs> uh, the Maritime Academy. Um, they're coming from colleges. They are learning on four million dollar boats with electronic pod drives. There aren't too many kids, if I, if I may, there aren't too many kids learning on a single screw tug um, or, you know, a, a tug like this. Um, most of their experience is going to be on, with one of the larger companies, uh, with one of the more advanced companies, and they'll get their, they'll kind of earn their bones, so to speak, and get the experience that way. Um, but you don't have too many people there's a few we have a gentleman that works with us and he's in the he's on the road to obtaining a master of tow you know it's it's 1200 hours i think total 1600 hours is what you have to obtain that's a lot and um with all the schooling but it, it's uh it's definitely something that you know i look around and see well who's you know who's coming up around us and when you find tugboat captains um, they're very hard to uh, they're very hard to, to actually locate because it's such a sought after commodity you know and like I said the guys that are good they're working um, and there's a lot of highly trained guys don't get me wrong there's a lot of highly trained individuals in the industry and uh, I just I don't see a lot of the young kids you know wanting to do this it's a true commitment it's a true commitment you know, and those that graduate, you have very bright students out of uh, SUNY Maritime. Um, they're going to graduate with unlimited third mate. 
and uh, if they have a, a document called the towing officer's assessment record, a limited third mate with at least a 200 ton master, they can operate a towing vessel. So there's requirements that are available to them to operate it, but getting the experience, that's the thing. That's the thing. We've had a few uh, students come on the boat and as an apprentice program, they have to do time on the boat if they want to get their documents signed off. So they'll come on board, they'll learn a few things, they'll learn, you know, come with us on a few tours and see how we operate and how we shift and tow. And, and um, luckily we've had some really great students come on board and, and they're, they're committed to their, to their career, to the future. Have you ever had to assist fishing boats? Um, or not too much? Not too much. We had uh, a small, small fishing vessel that lost steering. We weren't on this, we were on another boat, and we were able to assist them with one of our other boats, just kind of guide them, get them into safe harbor, so to speak. So. Well, I think that takes care of me for today. Well, I may you. find other things that I need <laughs> to ask you about, no but no I problem. do want to thank you, and that is the end of this interview. Thank you.